everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Lisa Manning. So Lisa did her bachelor in both physics and mathematics uh, at the um, University of Virginia, and then did her PhD at UC Santa Barbara. Um, in, uh, it's, it was a PhD in physics, and uh, Lisa has won many awards and fellowships, too many to count, but uh, recently she was uh, elected a fellow of the American Physical Society, so it is really a, a, a one of the highest honors you, one can get in, in, the, in the physics community. So congratulations to that. Uh, Lisa is currently a um, the William Keenan Jr. Professor of Physics at Syracuse University, and she's also the director of our Inspired Institute. So over to you, Lisa. Great, I'll go ahead and share my screen and hope it works the same way that it did before. <laughs> Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, yes, perfect. Did. Um, and one other thing, if it's OK with the organizers, I would be happy to take uh, questions during the uh, talk, but I have a hard time seeing them. So if somebody would interrupt me or it, feel free to interrupt me to ask questions. I, you know, this is a pretty interdisciplinary talk, so I feel like if somebody has a question, they should ask it right away because lots of people might have the same question. Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. We encourage that so people can just unmute themselves and, and shout or put questions on the chat and then I, I, I will, or Robert and I will interrupt Lisa when we Perfect. see the question. Okay. Great, and I can't see myself either, so hopefully you can see me and it's all good. Yeah, we can <laughs> <Okay>. see you. <laughs> okay, perfect. I'm not used to the team's environment, <laughs> but this is very, and I really, so thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, give this talk to you today. Um, as you can see from the title slide, the question is uh, going to be, how do single cells program collective behavior at the scale of tissues and organs? So, so, so Lisa, sorry, I, I, right now you're sharing, uh, sharing the screen so we can see the top bar of your oh, okay the yeah. as well. maybe so, uh, I can make maybe. it come over here um there we go is that better we uh, yeah, I think better. it's fine we can still see the top but I guess it's fine uh, yeah with, uh, Microsoft. You know, I, given, I think it's, it's good okay I will just leave it there in the hopes that it's okay <laughs> okay so uh before I go any further I need to highlight the people who did the work um, and so uh, this is my group and the most of what I'm highlighting today was performed in collaboration um, with uh, Margaret Gardell's group, a fantastic postdoc, Takaki Yamamoto, John Devaney, a graduate student in Margaret's group, and Daniel Sussman, who was a former postdoc in my group and is now a professor at Emory University. Okay, and so the question that I'm asking today is, you know, how do we think about cell autonomous behavior versus collective cell behavior? And so when you are used to asking the question, well, why does the cell move? You often describe things like, oh, there's uh, sort of ARP23 or actin and myosin or something that's going on inside this individual cell, which is actively allowing that particular cell to move, to crawl, to do something. Okay, so it's organizing dynamic focal adhesion and doing all of this cell autonomous stuff to move. OK, and so similarly, if you say, well, when does it stop moving? You say, well, OK, it's when it stops doing those things that allow it to move. Um, but we think that some features and behaviors um, that we observe in cells are governed by collective phenomena. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about that more throughout the talk. Um, I want to highlight that it can be challenging to predict. Um, and in particular, the uh, focus of my talk today is thinking about whether groups of cells are behaving more like a solid or more like a fluid. Um, and so you can think about that even for your own body, for your like what you think of as your physical body, right? Because, you know, if you think about walking around or, you know, kicking a football or something, that is things that you have to sort of your body has to be solid like to exert those shear stresses to do. But during certain times in development, um, and in particular, there's this nice uh, paper a few years ago now out of Oche Compass's group, there really needs to be 
fluid-like behavior, it's argued, in order to allow large-scale flows that allow you to, for example, set up the body axis of vertebrates or um, in other situations, gastrulation, where cells need to move over large distances. So this particular paper, you can see my mouse, yes? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, perfect. And so um, sort of at the bottom, so this is the elongating body axis of the zebrafish. And at the bottom, the tissue, it turns out, is very fluid-like. And in the uh, anterior part, it becomes much more solid-like. And these authors argue that that gradient in tissue fluidity, the collective behavior of the tissue, is really necessary in order to generate uh, that elongation process. Okay, and so if we're interested in trying to understand why tissues sort of, or how they go from being solid-like to fluid-like, you can ask a more specific question, which is how do cells program this behavior? You know, because DNA and whatnot, uh, sort of even epigenetics act on inside of the cell. And so you can ask, well, how do cells program this behavior? And then how do organisms use these fluid solid transitions in order to execute sort of global functions they need for things like development? Okay, and so I'm going to tell basically three vignettes today, but the first vignette is, I think, the one that I'll, uh, the, the major story of this talk, um, although I'll get a little distracted later on. Um, oh, there's a question? No. Okay, so how to quantify collective cell arrest? The first question is, well, we want to know when cells stop moving. How do we quantify that, and how can we explain the mechanisms for that in a collective. And so this is this work with uh, Margaret's group. And the sy system we're using is a very simple one. It's the standard MDCK cells. They're plated on a collagen gel. And so initially they're not confluent. So confluent means that the cells are all touching and there's no gaps or overlaps. And so a lot of epithelial cell layers will generate confluent monolayers. And so initially they're not confluent. And then we label time T equals zero when they come, become confluent. And then they evolve over about a day or so um, to become more and more confluent. And that's sort of the maturation of this epithelial monolayer. And we're interested in this process from zero hours to 12 hours to figure out what causes the behavior on that time frame. And so uh, we have a lot of data, which is, although this is an in vitro system, so it's boring in some ways, the great thing is we have a lot of data. So this is the membrane labeled GFP. This is showing you over as a function of time, the cell speed. So how fast the cell centers are moving and you can see they get slower and slower over time. And this is cell shape, which I'll talk about in more detail later, but that's another thing we can quantify very carefully in these and in, in an automated fashion in these epithelial monolayers. Okay, and so the major feature that I want to discuss today is that this tissue remodeling stops after several hours. So for example, if you look at the speed as a function of time after the system becomes confluent, it reduces and reduces, and then finally at a long time scale of like 12 hours or something like this, uh, even shorter than that, um, there's arrested cell motion. Um, and, and you can see that in other features, such as the number of cells per square micron um, or over time, you can see that there's also a, a rapid change and then it sort of starts to plateau at the end of this uh, experiment. So the cells aren't changing their number density anymore. And then also there's the same sort of observation in the cell shape. So they're changing their cell shapes a lot. Um, and then at the end of the experiment, they're not changing their cell shapes very much at all. So this is the phenomena that we're interested in explaining. And can so I just like ask, sorry, sure. Lisa, what is um, can I just ask briefly, what is the how do you characterize cell shape now by a single parameter at some elongation or, or, or what is it? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll talk about it in excruciating detail later, okay. but um, there because in the models, there's a particular para a single parameter that tells you about the cell shape that's important in the models. And so that's the one I'm showing you here. What it is, it's the ratio of a cell's 
perimeter to its area. So it is something like an elongation because if the perimeter is large relative to the area, then you get elongated shapes. And if it's um, small relative to the area, then you get uh, more rounded shapes. And it's actually the perimeter, of course, divided by the square root of the area to get a dimensionless number. That's okay. what this is. And I'll talk about it a lot more later. Thanks. Are there any other questions so far? Okay. Um, and so uh, we're going to then explore, there's been some proposed mechanisms for what is causing the cells in these dense monolayers to stop moving. And I'm going to discuss some of them in detail because in the literature right now, a lot of the times people note that one of these three things seems to be happening and they say that cells stop moving because of it. But actually it could be any one of them and they could be acting all at the same time. So our goal for this project is to tease apart which of these is really causing cell arrest and which is just kind of along for the ride. Okay, so the three things are crowding, something I'll call a vertex rigidity transition and something I'll call sort of zero temperature. And I'll talk about all of those as we go along. So first, let's discuss crowding because it's sort of the most obvious and actually the one with the longest history. So if I gave you a cup of water and I told you to freeze it, right? So if I told you to make it a solid, the first thing you do is to think to do is to put it in the freezer, right? To make it cold. But, you know, if you have some uh, physical uh, sort of natural sciences training, you know, the other thing that you can do is increase the pressure on it. You can also solidify materials by changing the pressure, by making the molecules in that material more crowded. And so why is it our intuition that in general, as you increase the pressure on one of these standard materials that they solidify? Why do rigidity transitions occur under pressure or under increase in density? And I'm gonna walk you through the argument in probably the most simple system, although very similar things happen in a lot of other systems. So um, in the system of disordered spheres, at zero temperature, and by zero temperature, I just mean that thermal fluctuations aren't enough to jostle the object. So think a jar of marbles here, jar of marbles, okay? Then in that jar of marbles, there are the number of marbles, so the number of particles, NP, times D, which is the number of dimensions, degrees of freedom. I'll call that capital N, right? So that's the number of ways that the marbles can move. Okay, and as the system gets more and more crowded, those marbles start to make contacts with one another. So if each marble has on average Z contacts with other marbles, that's this little Z here, then the number of constraints is just the number of those bonds. So the number of those bonds is the number of particles times its average number of contacts. And then of course you have to divide by two because each of those contacts is shared between two particles. Okay, so that's the number of constraints, capital M. Then, in, in, is there a question? Nope, okay. In mean field, we expect then rigidity to occur when those two quantities, the number of degrees of freedom, exactly equal the number of constraints. And then it's just one or two lines of algebra to show that that happens when little v equals two times the number of dimensions, okay? So therefore, if you're at low densities, the number of constraints is less than that critical number and the system is under constrained. So it's flop, floppy, it's flows, it's not a solid, it's not rigid. And at high density, densities, the number of contacts is greater than that critical number. And so the system is over constrained. And rather miraculously, I was saying that this mean field argument works incredibly well for jars of marbles. It actually works exactly right for jars of marbles. And then it also gives a lot of other systems interesting features and it explains a lot of properties of various mechanical systems. Okay. So that's great. And in fact, there's um, this paper by Oche Compass's group argues that it's precisely this number of constraints, this constraint counting, this sort of crowding that generates the rigidity transition in this pre-Semitic mesoderm. So crowding changes in cell packing fraction or the number density is rigid is responsible for rigidity in this system and actually there's another really nice paper coming out or if it hasn't come out already from eduardo Hanezo and cp heisenberg 
that has this says the same thing about sort of the uh, dome of zebrafish, so a much earlier stage. So there's a few examples already where crowding really generates rigidity in these cellular systems. So it clearly is important. So, okay. so one quick question, Lisa. So you you talked about the the contacts uh, between in the case of marbles, right? Between marbles, but in confluent tissues. Then, then there wouldn't uh, in, in 2D uh, generally you would have five six contacts per cell. So how do they count contact in that? Yeah, context? so it turns out if you sort of if you're not completely confluent. So if there's sort of some free volume. So there's a lot of actually, and that's one of, I think of the beautiful things in the in Oche's paper is they really they injected dextrion and they showed that actually there was a lot more sort of extracellular space than people had thought, especially down here at the bottom of this tail bud. And so it actually turns out that if it's sort of like a wet foam, then actually there really is a concept of contacts and that they're sort of, you get one like sort of squishy contact across each interface or facet. And so mm. it turns out that although this system is um, sort of, it has, more than the critical number of contacts, there's actually also active fluctuations that act to fluidize it. So it's the combination of the number of contacts and the activity that generates the behavior in that system. But mm -hmm. the important point is they argue, I think pretty convincingly that the number of contacts sort of, which is governed by sort of also the, den the number density is really driving this. Okay. But you're exactly right. I'm about to talk about in confluent tissues where there really is no gaps between the cells, then something very different obtains. So I'll, I'll talk about that and then I'll come back to your question later if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So um, in these confluent systems, you have a different picture. So you assume that in these systems, there really are the cells are basically taking up all of the space in the system. So as, as you just said, there's no idea of, you know, everything has all of the contacts everywhere. And so if you look at a bird's eye view of an epithelial monolayer that's completely confluent, basically it looks like a tiling of polygons. And so if you would like to to describe using a model those polygons, um, you sort of notice that there's two main features of the polygons. There's their cross-sectional area A and their cross-sectional perimeter P. And a lot of folks, starting with Honda actually 20 years ago now, basically used these vertex models, they're called vertex models, to describe cell shapes in these confluent tissues. And for this talk, I'm not going to go into the, all of the details, although I could talk forever about this. <laughs> I won't today. Um, I'll just say for, maybe I'll keep it to what I would say for a physics audience, which is that if you assume that cells have a preferred or homeostatic area that they like to have. So I'll denote that with this A naught. So this is the preferred cross-sectional area. And they also work to have a preferred perimeter. I'll call that preferred perimeter P naught. Then this energy functional is the stupidest one you can write down. It's quadratic away from those constraints. It's the sort of first order thing that you would write down as per Per, the cost of perturbations away from those homeostatic values. Now, the, you can get a lot more, like there's been a lot of work to show where these terms come from um, in real biological systems. So for example, the linear term in the perimeter looks like an interfacial tension. Um, and so that comes from adhesion, for example, and cortical tension in the cells. Um, but in any case, this is the model. And then that's what gives rise to that shape parameter that I was describing earlier, because if you non-dimensionalize this equation, you realize rather quickly that there's basically one important dimensionless parameter, and I'll call that little p naught. And in, in this expression, it's just again the target perimeter. So this is the perimeter that cells want to have, and it's divided by the square root of the area that cells want to have. And so again, if you have a lower shape index, then you're more rounded. That's the easiest way to get it. And then you can become more and more elongated as you increase the perimeter relative to the area. There's other ways to do it, like by making like starfish shapes or something, but like cells don't usually do that. They do this, they elongate instead. Okay. So that's the model. Um, 
And the thing that we discovered a few years ago, well, more than a few, five years ago now, is that if you look in the absence of active stress fluctuation, so this is sort of the zero temperature limit. <laughs> so you just assume there's no fluctuations at all and you can study this as a model. You can observe that this model has a rigidity transition. And so if the critical, if this, there's a critical value of P0 and it happens to be at 3.81 uh, for most models, um, that if you go, if you have cells that are more elongated than that critical value, then the tissue is fluid-like or soft or has no energy barriers. And if you have a cell shape that's less than that critical value, so it's more rounded, um, then the tissue is rigid. Um, and so then you can say, well, I want to know what happens in the presence of active stress fluctuations. And so you, because a lot of the time measuring rigidity rigidity in a tissue is very, very hard. Lots of folks are working on trying to measure mechanics inside one of these confluent monolayers or inside in vitro, in vivo systems, but it's very hard. So in the absence of active, or in the presence of active stress fluctuations, we can use cell movement as a readout of emergent mechanics, okay? Because if you just put a tiny bit of stress fluctuations in the system, then if you're above this critical shape value, then there's no energy barriers to rearrangements. And so the cells will move around and change neighbors and diffuse. But if you're below this critical value, then the cells won't move around and change neighbors and they'll behave as a solid. And so you can look at little you know, pictures of this in simulations, which is fun. So this is exactly the same sort of temperature, if you will. So we've put the same amount of stress fluctuations in both of these, but this one is slightly on the solid side of the transition. So the cell shapes are on the solid side. We've programmed it to have more solid like cell shapes. And over here, the cell shapes are a little bit uh, more elongated. And so um, the, the system behaves more like a fluid. Sorry, my movies are a little wonky here. I don't know why, but I can probably page you through them. So here they're clearly diffusing on this side. Okay, so I wanna take a brief moment because something we've actually been working on over the past five years since we published that original work is, can you really use this to make predictions in, in, you know, in vivo systems and how would you go about doing it? So we and a few other folks have tried to take this and make it a real quantitative theory. And so I wanna highlight um, this recent paper that we published with Karen Keisha's group at the University of Columbia on fruit flies along with some other folks in both of our groups. Okay, and so I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of the details, but I wanna say that we've done a lot of work to say, okay, if you want to make this a quantitative theory, you do need to measure that cell shape index that we talked about already. So that's um, this axis. So this is the average shape index. And so if I look along this axis, oh, sorry, this picture is showing you exactly what I said before. Is like when I have a low shape index, I'm solid. And that means that I'm blue over here. So I don't have any floppy configurations. And then if I have a high shape index, I'm uh, red or I'm floppy, right? But then what we noticed is that if you have an anisotropic system, so that happens a lot in development, for example, where you have convergent extension or planar cell polarity, again, or you have shear stresses that are straining the system, any one of those things, it turns out. Um, you also need to look at the alignment of cell shapes. And so this axis, for those of you who know about nomadic order parameters, it's very similar to a nomadic order parameter, how aligned the cells are. But it's cool because unlike liquid crystals, the cells don't have exactly the same shape all the time. So you have to multiply the nomadic order parameter by the degree of elongation of the cells. Because of course, if the cells aren't elongated at all, then their alignment becomes less and less meaningful, right? So it's sort of like a modified nomadic order parameter for things that can change their shape. So it's a little different from liquid crystal physics. But anyway, that's this axis. 
Okay, and then a third thing that you have to measure, and this was first highlighted um, by Max Dapeng B's group in a, this beautiful PRX in 2019, is that you have to also quantify the disorder in the network of the of the packing. So you can um, look at the coordination of vertices. So for example, rosettes will change the disorder in the packing. There's other ways to do it too. And so if you, it turns out if you measure these three things, so these are observables now, things that you can measure and experiment because this is the observed shape index. I was talking about the target shape index before, which is the shape that the cells sort of want to have, but this is the observed shape index. This is the shape that the cells are observed to have. This thing you can quantify too. So for those of you that do experiments, like, if you would like to read this paper, we kind of go through in nauseating detail how to do all of this and calculate all of these things. And so then once you do that, um, once you quantify those three things, then we can compare it to, for example, what's going on in fruit flies. So this is real data from fruit fly body axis elongation. So, so one, one very quick question. If you go back to that phase diagram uh, before, one slide before, what, uh, so, so we, uh, I, there's this little blue incursion yeah, around there. So, so, so what's yeah. going on there? So it turns out that this is basically a set of states that's very sensitive to initial conditions. So um, there actually is this sort of um, uh, sort of uh, degeneracy of states here that I, it's actually rather it's a numerical thing. Um, okay. If you if you if you want to sort of Honestly, what it is, is that we just don't have a lot of resolution here because there is some interesting geom, it's, it's a geometric effect. It's a, it's sort of a real thing, but it's also a numerical thing. Mm -hmm. And it makes, so those states really are floppy. They're not stiff, but it's just mm -hmm. hard to resolve because there's very, there's energy barriers nearby. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's probably, I could talk to you in a lot more detail about it later. <laughs> um, so, uh, so what we did is we looked at a uh, real uh, uh, data from an uh, ze for, from sorry, not a zebrafish, a fruit fly embryo. And in the fruit fly, you can look at the trajectory of cell shapes over time in a single embryo. So up here in this corner is the trajectory of a single embryo. So it starts out solid like, and then it becomes more and more aligned. And then it crosses back through this critical point, and then it goes into the fluid-like phase is the prediction of our model. So this black line here is actually an analytic prediction. It's like, it's not even numerical. It's an analytic prediction with no fit parameters now. So absolutely no fit parameters a priori that we predict in the model, because after you do all of this work to look at these three things. And so what you can see is then if we fill in a whole bunch of embryos now, what you see is that we this black line is supposed to separate the solid phase from the fluid phase, okay? Where cells should not be able to rearrange and where they should. And this color bar is showing you the data from the fruit fly after we've collected it from uh, about 10 or 15 fruit fly embryos, because these are very difficult experiments. So I think what you can safely see is this a priori analytic line really separates the solid phase where this we can predict now whether in this fruit fly the cells are going to rearrange or not from just a snapshot we can predict their dynamics just from their structure at this point which i think is pretty cool and can so just, here, oh go ahead sorry lisa so um so so that's every data point is one embryo you said yeah so, uh, so ever, no, it's one um, frame from a movie of an embryo. So one okay. embryo over time does what's in this inset yeah, here. Exactly. So you're saying that's a particular tissue you're looking at. I was wondering about uh, heterogeneity um, within an embryo. Obviously, not all the cells are the same. Um, so maybe you're looking at a particular tissue. As that's probably what is happening. And also, I was wondering about um, you know solid versus fluid uh, phases. Does it correspond to any biological processes which would, uh, you know, make sense in terms of set classification? Yeah, so those are both really good questions. So the first thing is, is yes, this is the sort of um, body axis elongation process. So like there's many other tissues that sort of are epithelial in the fruit fly. Like a lot of people worked on like the imaginal wing disc or something like this. We're just focused on the body axis elongation of the fruit fly at one of the earliest stages, right? And so that tissue, and these are, 
average numbers taken over a field of view. And as you can see in these pictures up at the top, they're really, they're pretty, this is a pretty homogeneous tissue. There's not a lot of fluctuations in space or time, although that changes later. And that's interesting to ask, okay, well, can you average this over smaller sections and what can you predict where, you know, there are floppy regions that are coexisting with rigid regions later, okay? And then your second question was, does this correspond to specific process? Yeah, I mean, we think this fluidization occurs precisely when the axis, like the body really starts to move quickly, right? Because these rearrangements really facilitate the elongation of the body axis so that you get a much like this aspect ratio change that's really large, right? So we think, I mean, of course, we can't say with certainty, but this sort of fluidization is really what drives this body axis elongation process. And I'm not showing it here in this talk, but we have some mutants that really have uh, problems with body axis elongation and they stay in the solid phase the whole time. So the, you know, if you're in the solid phase, you really can't rearrange and therefore you can't really change your aspect ratio nearly as much over these long time scales. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it's fascinating, really. Cool. Okay. So then, so what I would say about the, the sort of before I move on from this small vignette is, is that it's clear that this vertex model based rigidity transition, which has sort of this very specific set of features where you have to measure the cell shape, the cell shape is the governing feature, really works in some systems, right? In some uh, biological tissues that are confluent with no gaps, this is the physics that's governing the rigidity. Okay, and so you might say, well, is it the same physics? Is crowding that you just told me about for zebrafish the same in some deep way as this tension-driven vertex model rigidity that I just talked about? And the answer is no, they are different, okay? And I can tell you we've done a lot of work. Um, there are a class of what I will call mechanical metamaterials. Um, so things like origami, fiber networks, for example, so like ECM networks have this property, and also these vertex models have this property, that they undergo a rigidity transition at a fixed network topology. That means they don't change their number of nearest neighbors. And instead, they change a continuous parameter, such as for fiber networks, it's the amount of strain. So maybe many of you are familiar with how ECM networks, if you strain them, all of a sudden they'll stiffen by orders of magnitude, right? So you're changing a continuous parameter, which is the strain of your box, and you're not changing the connectivity of the fiber network, right? So this class, and the same is true of vertex models, actually exactly the same in some deep way as vertex models, and it actually turns out Origami works very similarly. Um, and I'm not going to go through the details again in this talk, but it boils down to the fact that these sort of systems, these mechanical metamaterials, can support states of self stress at the rigidity transition. And it's something called second order rigidity that generates it. So, constraint counting. You know, I told you that picture of like I have a jar of marbles and I count how many constraints. There are, <laughs> that is what's called linear rigidity because it counts sort of the number to linear order what's happening to the behavior of the network. Okay, so constraint counting or crowding are systems, if they rigidify according to that rule, then they're uh, rigidifying according to linear rigidity, okay? But it turns out that in these vertex models, origami fiber network models, you actually have higher order rigidity that's generating rigidity. So constraint counting actually doesn't work at all in those systems because it's not first order perturbations that matter, it's second order perturbations that matter. Okay, so for those of you who care about that sort of stuff, I just wanted to say it, it's fundamentally different in a very deep way. <laughs> okay, so, um, and you know, I can talk more about it and like, well, I could talk about it for a whole nother hour, but I won't do that. If you want to ask me questions, I could talk about that too. Okay, but I want to get to the third point because I think the third point is actually really important for a lot of biological systems of interest. And so this third point is, is that, okay, well, I could also just say that 
perhaps in the biological tissue, because, you know, m most of the activity that we care about is, say, ATP driven. And so if all of the fluctuations stop, which, of course, the biological system can do, it can say, OK, I'm going to stop generating these fluctuations, then the you, you sort of go to something which is effectively zero temperature. And physicists don't usually think about zero temperature systems very much, especially when it comes to like molecular systems, because that's really low temperature, right? So. OK, so the question that we're going to be asking now is can cell arrest occur even when the system is not rigid? OK, so to set up this problem, I'm going to show you a picture of how we think about this in the modeling system. So in the in the modeling, we know how we're controlling the temperature or the number of fluctuations or the magnitude of fluctuations in the system. So you can think about this as OK, how many fluctuations are we putting in our model? That's this axis. And you can also think about in these vertex models, changing the important control parameter, which is the shape of the cells, right? And so you can imagine that if I want my system to undergo cell arrest, and actually there's also clues in the system that these things are happening, that, well, the fluctuations in the system are going down as the epithelial layer matures, but also the cell shape is changing. And so I've drawn you three pictures of trajectories in model space that all kind of do that, but in different ways, right? So I'm just showing you some examples of how in a model you could make the system become rigid or the cells to stop moving. And then you could say, OK, what does that look like in observable space and something that an experimentalist could actually look like? OK, and so this is a now the output of the model, which is how much are the cells moving? This is cell speed actually averaged over some time scale. So this is how fa how fast the cells are moving on this axis. And this is the observed shape parameter. And so what you can see actually, as it turns out, is that in vertex models, all of these curves overlay each other almost exactly. And that's because there's this intervening rigidity transition, this deep rigidity transition that's happening down here. And so all the curves, it turns out, collapse. If you cross the rigidity transition first and then go to zero temperature, they all collapse. And that's because there's this intervening rigidity transition. But let's say you didn't do that. So I'm going to show you two more trajectories in model space. Let's say that you followed this trajectory where you went to zero temperature before you hit the rigidity transition. So the rigidity transition occurs over here. So this thing is just slowing down to zero temperature before crossing the rigidity transition. And so is this one, OK? And so you can say, well, what does that look like in, a, in you know, an experiment? And what you can see is that actually then the two lines don't all, they don't collapse anymore. And in fact, what happens is the system gets stuck in a floppy regime. So these systems are still floppy, but you're just at zero temperature. So the cells don't move anymore. Right. So this behavior has a very different signature in this observable space than if you go through the rigidity transition first before you go to zero temperature. That's the important point. So we might hope that we could actually try to see what's happening in experiment by looking at data like this. And that's what we're going to try to do. OK, so if the system gets to absolute zero temperature, zero fluctuations before it gets to the rigidity transition, then cells can, of course, of course they can stop even though the system is still floppy. That's pretty obvious in hindsight, actually. OK, so now we're going to say, OK, which of these, if any, are causing the cells to stop moving in Margaret Gardell's experiments? OK, uh, and so this Lisa. is, what, yeah. Hey, Lisa, uh, sorry, just a quick question. Um, there is this results also from uh, from the lab of Pascal Silberson where they've actually shown that um, the kinetic arrest that you see in, in, in monolayers can also be due to strengthening of the cell cell adhesions and cell substrate adhesions. Is that any, like, do you take any of that into account in the, in the models you're talking about? Because they claim that crowding is actually a secondary effect um, compared to strengthening of the cell cell adhesions. And I'm not seeing in those models anything that would resemble strengthening of, of, these, uh, of, these, uh, of these junctions. 
That's a great question. So actually what I would say is, is that in our models, this target shape actually is a result of a combination of things, including the strength of cell cell adhesions. So in our model, those sort of features, are like the sort of stiffness of the cells, the stiffness of their cell cell adhesions, et cetera, are actually incorporated in this, what I would say, mesoscopic variable. And so, um, you know, and, and the, the, actually the modeling that they did for that particular paper um, was by Hakim, and those models are very similar to these models I'm presenting okay. here. And so what I would say is actually this is a slightly different way of interpreting their data. So they say, oh, it's because of strengthening of cell cell adhesions, um, but they they don't sort of have, I would say, a and, and they have really beautiful data and that's right, but they don't have like a, what I would say as a mesoscopic description of precisely when that rigidity happens. Like, what is it about those cell-cell contacts reaching that specific point that solidifies the system there, right? Okay. As opposed to at a slightly different point. So what you're saying is that your your, your control parameter is a coarse-grained version of, well, th there is information about cell-cell adhesion strengthening in that peanut. Exactly. And so what we're trying to do, and actually I'll, I'll give you the punchline, what I would try to articulate is actually because we think that this is the control parameter for the rigidity, that actually measuring cell shape is the best readout because it's not just cell-cell adhesion strengthening, it's what cell-cell adhesion strengthening does to the cell shape that generates the rigidity. So that's an even stronger okay. claim. So you, I don't know, <laughs> and I don't know if, if uh, Pascal would agree with me. We've talked a lot about this, but that's what I'm trying to claim here anyway. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, so this is what our data looks like. So um, if you quantify the shape parameter um, along this axis and the speed along this axis, and again, this is an average over a field of view. So hundreds of cells are averaged in each one of these data points. And this is a trajectory from one experiment. And so these error bars are giving you basically the standard deviation in these quantities over a field of 100 cells or so, right? Um, and you can see that you start out with a large shape parameter and a large speed. And then over time, you go to a much smaller shape parameter and a much lower speed. So this is just to give you an idea of what the data looks like. And you can see with your eye, of course, that something important has changed about the structure of the cells from this time point to this time point. So, um, but it's not just their shapes, right? Their densities are changing too. So it could be crowding, right? The number density is changing and the cell shape is changing. So which is most important, okay? Can I just and so ask way, something, Lisa? Yes. Sorry, again, to interrupt. So just looking at this image, so, um, uh, what is uh, uh, highlighted in the experimental image? I guess it's sort of um, ecotherin or some some. No, it's a membrane. It's it's a membrane. I think it's a gap, a mem membrane gap um, protein. So yeah, I just was, yeah. Oh, go ahead. So, sorry, I was wondering about the, the shape parameter. You just uh, explained that the shape parameter is determined by the adhesion strengths. Um, and I was wondering now in the experimental images if you can see particular molecular markers for instance you know things are highlighting uh it's a membrane being localized maybe the speed i don't know if there's a particular marker maybe um you know i, I don't know polarity factors or or, or some kind um uh, i don't know if there's any um molecular readouts for these two microscopic parameters you have yeah, so that's a great question, and I, I could really talk about it a lot. Um, what I'll say is two brief things, which is that first, it's not just cell-cell adhesion that's generating cell shape. For example, we know that there's really strong coupling between cell adhesion and cortical actomycin activity via like Rho and RAC pathways, for example. And so actually the cortical actomycin is actually orders, at least by some measurements, orders of magnitude stronger than adhesion in most epithelial layers. So if you do an experiment where you look at the, like, the AFM strength of ECAD-ECAD interactions, and then you actually try to quantify using STED the number of ECAD here in molecules that are at that interface, okay, so you get an estimate for the energy density per unit area of ECADs, those estimates give you uh, orders of magnitude lower 
energies, then measurements of cortical actomyosin via like double pipette aspiration measurements or, or something like that. So what that suggests actually is that the cadherins in some of these systems are acting as signaling molecules. So it's not the energy density of them, but actually they're signaling of the nearby adjacent actomyosin cortex that's dominating the energetics of these cell shapes. Okay, that's one point. The second point is we've actually done some work with Kareen Neeson's group to actually look at a series of e cadherin knockdowns um, in MDCK monolayers and ask, okay, okay, if you just knock down e cadherin, what does that do to the cell shape? So you're just doing like one parameter knockdowns if you can. And so we have some data that it really does seem like programming um, ECAD does program cell shape, but actually in the opposite way that you would think. And again, the reason that that makes so normally you would think that, okay, if I had more adhesion molecules, then I would prefer more contact with my neighbor. So I would have more perimeter. Okay, in a recent unpublished data with Kareem Neeson's group, it actually goes the opposite way. So if you actually knock down e cadherin, so you have less adhesion molecules, the interfaces between cells, the perimeters actually elongate. And we have some, again, some preliminary data that that's because what actually is happening is there's a down regulation of cortical actomyosin underneath those e cadherins. And so that actually causes less cortical tension and that elongates the cell. Yeah, so it sounds very good. And what about the speed? So, so, so what is determining at the molecular level the speed? Is it just, as you say, it's just a result, the speed of the crowding increasing, so the speed goes down? Or well, is there some yeah. other factors? I mean, that's what I'm going to try to show you and then maybe in the next minute or so. Yeah. Um, let, let me try to show you and then I'm happy to try to answer that question if I didn't. Okay, so, so exactly. So we have this idea that um, we'd like to test that the speed is decreasing because there's a rigidity transition or because there's crowding or because the temperature has gone to zero. So we're asking which one of those things is causing the speed to go down. And so the experiment that Margaret did, which I think is really clever, is that we know that the cell areas, the cross-sectional areas change on substrates of different stiffnesses. So if you plate the exact same cells on substrates of different stiffnesses, you can get very different densities of cells because on the stiffer substrates, they prefer a different density, right? And so I'm going to show you data now for speed, the speed at which cells move as a function of the number density. And so you should read this as the amount of crowding, right? The amount of crowding is on this axis and the speed is on this axis. And then we've just changed the stiffness of the substrate in various ways by changing the cross linkers or changing the density of the collagen, okay? And so what you see, I think, obviously, is that these curves do not overlap at all. There's very little collapse of the data. And so that suggests that at the very least, number density is not a good order parameter for the speed. In other words, crowding does not tell you when you should expect the speed to go to zero or the cells to arrest. And so that suggests that the crowding in this particular example, that crowding, which is increasing the number density, is not what's generating the rigidity. Instead, if you plot the speed versus the shape parameter, the data collapses sort of, I would say, remarkably beautifully. And if you recall, that's exactly what was predicted in the vertex models if you cross the rigidity transition before you get to zero temperature. Right, so this data, this beautiful collapse of the shape parameter as a function of the speed, which is in big contrast to the number density, strongly suggests to us that this vertex rigidity transition is what's occurring in these wild type cells, that it's this sort of confluent vertex driven rigidity transition that's generating this decrease in speed. And if you look at the uh, behavior of pharmacological perturbation. So we tried really a very large number of pharmacological perturbations. This happens to be a RAC inhibitor. Um, you see, 
oops, sorry. You see that actually the data doesn't. So this was all wild type data just on different stiffnesses. So the cells were all had the, uh, the sort of same behavior, except they were just plated on different stiffnesses. But now if you in, uh, do a RAC inhibitor, but it turns out a lot of other things happen, then you start to see that they don't collapse anymore. And in fact, they stop overlaying each other. So they go to zero speed essentially, or to very low speeds really before they get to this shape parameter where we expect them to rigidify. And so these two data points, these inhibited data points, start to look a lot like these points on the model where you take the system to zero temperature before you cross the rigidity transition. And in fact, okay, but then we have to tell you, well, what are those fluctuations that we stopped? Okay, what does putting in a rack inhibitor, for example, change? There's, and, and like I said, there's lots of other things. And it turns out that all of the pharmacological perturbations that we tried that messed with this collapse mess with cell divisions in some important way. And so we have a lot of data, and I realize that I'm, I'm sort of going kind of over time. So I'll just do this really quickly. Is, is that there is a reduction in active stress fluctuations over time, we think, because the cells sort of get stuck in the cell cycle and they stop dividing. So this is like contact inhibition of cell division, right? Um, and so over time, you can see that more and more cells get stuck in the, basically in uh, the green phase. There's a lot less purple, okay? And so they're getting stuck in their cell cycle. And so we can model that by, okay, so this is some, you know, we can model it decreasing the number of cells that have active stress fluctuations in our model, and we can do it in a way that looks like the experimental data. So we're here, we're decreasing the fraction of fluctuating cells. And then what you see is if you decrease the fraction of fluctuating cells, they do get stuck. So I'm just showing you some trajectories of cells that get stuck. Um, they get stuck before they get to the rigidity transition. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you about this vignette three. This is just a story saying, okay, you know, somebody asked, do these fluid solid transitions mean anything and are they important for stuff? And this is just a story saying, yeah, the fluid flow around this organ actually impacts its shape and stuff. And so whether the surrounding tissue is fluid like or solid like is really important for this system, but I don't have time to tell you that. So I'll just focus on the two vignettes I already told you, which is that organisms need to be able to tune the collective motility of cells in order to control tissue form and function. So the tissue fluidity can control things like buckling. So if you're more solid-like, you can buckle, right? If you're more fluid-like, you can't buckle. And if you're more fluid-like, though, you can basically move cells past one another. And actually, it turns out that there's a few examples now of where we think that as cells migrate, as groups of cells migrate through tissues, because of the fluid-like drag forces on those organs, you can actually change the shape of an organ and program its shape using those dynamic forces, which is pretty cool. Okay, but the main part of my talk was uh, saying, let's see if I can get it to say it. I think I'm stuck here. Uh-oh. I seem to have lost my uh, mouse. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. We can also see your cursor moving around. Okay, I cannot see my cursor. So I'm going to end the show because I can't change anything. Let's see if I end the show. Oh, my computer is totally frozen. Um, so what, since you can still hear me, I'm just going to sort of I although I would love to get to the acknowledgement section to <laughs> remind you of who did the work, but maybe I will try, we can sort of end the show there. So I'll say the rest of the conclusions on the slide basically are that there are three ways that you can generate cell arrest. You can, oh, there it goes. Oh, <laughs> it came back. Okay, um, so let me uh, go back to my conclusion slide and I won't go to that one because it apparently was problematic. So I will just show you the thank you slide, but I will tell you the conclusions. Um, so the conclusions are that there's three ways of inducing collective cell arrest. It's crowding, which is this sort of number of neighbors that I have, or tension-driven rigidity, which is the cell shape or the cell adhesion-driven uh, rigidity that's the same as this ECM, and it's driven by second-order rigidity. And then there is also what I would call zero temperature um, which is basically that the system can just 
because it's an active system, it can just decide to stop fluctuating. And so then the cells won't change neighbors, but it's simply because even though the collective is still fluid-like, the cells have just completely stopped moving and so they don't change neighbors. So those are the three ways. And there are, in, you know, for forward-looking, the idea would be that if you're doing experiments, you should really try to not just say, oh, my cells have undergone a collective arrest, you should try to figure out which of these mechanisms me mechanisms is operating because it's different in different systems. We already have examples of where it's different in different systems. And just because you see an increase in number density doesn't mean that increase in number density is generating rigidity. <laughs> it does in some systems, but in some systems, it's just along for the ride and say cell shape is really generating rigidity or sometimes it's the fluctuations. Okay, so thanks so much for your attention. I'm sorry about some of those technical difficulties. And I especially wanna highlight the work of um, Daniel Sussman, uh, Takaki Yamamoto and John Devaney, who are the junior folks on the main project I discussed. All right, thank you very much for the fantastic talks. Um, are there any questions? So maybe I I ask I I ask a quick question. So you I, I think in your third part you were going to show some three D results. So in three D, do we have this kind of shaped uh, in do or, or perimeter versus um, uh, volume uh, parameter that dictate whether it's in the fluid phase or in the in the solid phase? Yes, it, it works in exactly the same way. So, uh, of course, the dimensionless parameter then is the surface area divided by the volume to the two thirds. But there's also a critical point. It happens to be at a different number. It's 5.4 <laughs> for mm -hmm. that dimensionless variable in 3D. Um, but it all works very similarly. So, for example, this data here is uh, showing you this uh, the equivalent parameter in 3D, which is right. you know, uh, and the transition is at 5.4. Mm -hmm at zero mm. temperature. And then this is showing you, because we're actually moving this organ through the 3D tissue. And so this axis is the velocity at which you're moving this organ. Um, and so the blue means that, okay, you're trying to basically push on the organ, but it's not moving because the result, the material is, the material around it is solid like. And here it starts to move up in this quadrant uh, as the tissue fluidity increases and the force on which you're pushing increases. All right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question, Lisa. So thank you also from my perspective. Um, it's fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, I was wondering, you know, so you had talked about a lot of different concepts since the beginning. You know, you talked about solids and fluids in the human body. And I, I was thinking of, say, um, say sort of classical um, uh, first order phase transition in terms of um, uh, solids and fluids. But then you started talking about the second order stuff. Um, I was thinking originally of second order order disorder, but then you talked about second order rigidity and higher order rigidity. And so there are all these concepts, crowding, uh, active fluctuations. I don't know if there, is there any way to to organize these different concepts yeah. for the less for the for the no experts on the on the on the talk. Yeah. Including me actually. <laughs> yeah, so that's a really good question. So one thing to say is the crowding transition, the disordered jamming transition is what's called a mixed first, second order transition. It has discount. So there's there's discontinuous things in it and there's also continuous things across the transition. So, for example, the coordination number. So that little Z jumps from being exactly zero below jamming to exactly the critical number at jamming. So there's a discontinuous jump in the number of contacts, but things like the shear modulus are actually look a lot like a second order critical point. So they even have icing model like scaling. So there's, there's the first thing, which is, okay, if you're trying to characterize these rigidity transitions in the system, you know, in the standard physics way, the crowding transition has mixed character. It turns out that the second that these um, rigidity transitions in fiber networks and vertex models are purely second order. So they have mean field Ising like critical scaling, <laughs> as it turns out we've shown. Um, so they're beautiful second order phase transitions with like, you know, growing fluctuation length scales and stuff like that. They have all of that physics in them. <laughs> 
OK, but then there's the second. So so that's the nature of the transition. But then there's sort of like a different body of work, which mostly comes from mathematics and structural engineering, which asks about the behavior of, let's say, the potential energy landscape. OK, and so um, let, let me just try to give you a little bit of that picture as to why I was referring to them as second versus first order. So the idea there is, is that you start from an idea of where you have um, typically bars and hinges because the historical um, work for work done on this was done on like tensegrity structures. So let me show you because I do have a picture in this talk, I think, of like a tensegrity structure. So um, and the idea is, is that you ask in those systems whether the constraints are satisfied or unsatisfied. And you can ask whether they're satisfied or unsatisfied to first order in the constraints or second order. So, so you have all of these constraints and you can ask whether those constraints are satisfied to first order in the length of the bonds or second order in the length of the bonds or third order or to all orders. OK, you can ask that question. So that's the mathematical problem. And just briefly, it turns out that figuring out whether a bar spring network is rigid or not is in general NP hard. So you actually can't even do it. It's like really hard, NP hard. But first order rigidity is really easy to calculate. And so what mathematicians have done is characterized the circumstances under which you can look only at first order perturbations for the constraints and whether that's sufficient to say whether it's rigid. So that's first order rigidity or constraint counting. And then you can ask the same question about second order. So you can say, is it actually um, rigid? You know, if you can show that it's rigid to second order, under what circumstances does that imply that the whole system is rigid? And that's what's called second order rigidity. And then actually it turns out that third order and higher order rigidities are ill-defined. So second order is all you get. So you only have to go to first or second order. It's been proven mathematically. Um, that's as far as you can go consistently. So yes. that's the answer to your question is there's standard critical phenomena and there's one description. And this rigidity I was talking about is a very special thing that has to do with the constraints. Yeah, thank you very much for the mini tutorial. Um, and it's fantastic to see that rich behavior um, in the system. So I think there was a question by by Jesse. Yes. Yeah, just ask it directly. Yes, yeah, so now you hear me, right? Great. Thank you. That was a great talk. Uh, so as a biologist, I'm actually wondering if there are any basically micro or macro scale measurements that could guide us to, war to distinguish which of these three mechanisms that you show could be at play, basically. Because especially I can imagine like a scenario where crowding is, is essentially a less likely scenario where, for example, boundary conditions are fixed as compared to situations where boundary conditions are more uh, flexible. So are there any like micro or macro scale measurements that could guide us there, essentially? That's a really good question. So I think, um there's a couple of things to say. One is is that um, these experiments that folks are, are doing now, so people have often assumed that if something looks confluent on a confocal microscope image, that it is confluent. Um, and so one of the really neat things that's been happening recently is people are injecting things like dextran, fluorescent dextran into their model systems to look for extracellular space. Because I think one of the important questions is, well, how confluent is confluent? <laughs> you know, because I think it is true that in most of the examples we have investigated so far, if the system is very close to confluent, in other words, that the extracellular gaps are very small, then it seems to be dominated by these like vertex model rigidity transitions. And if the gaps are even, you know, maybe a tenth or more of the size of the cells, then it starts to be more in this regime where the number of contacts is driving the physics. And so there's been some recent experiments where people have really tried to carefully sort of map out the connectivity networks and the extracellular spaces. And that seems to be a really good way to distinguish you know, which of these models you think might be operating. So that's one thing. A second thing is, is that you can um, look in, in, in a case where you think that you're in a confluent system, 
there's a lot more things that are becoming available to really sort of in using machine learning to automatedly quantify cell shapes. So I would sell, say that the cell shape parameter is a really nice sort of pretty easy to now guess, you know, quantifier. And it sort of seems to be a great readout of a lot of it's it's sort of, I would say, an integrated readout of a lot of features of cell cell contacts. So, you know, I would recommend looking at that in your systems and seeing if the cell shape correlates with some features, you know, of the system that you're looking at. So that's another measurement. And then um, there's a third set of mechanical measurements that people are starting to make, but those are a lot more difficult and re require sort of a lot of work to get to that point. So it's not as simple as making a measurement, but there's a lot of folks that are embedding either. Um, so Oche Compass has these ferrofluidic droplets that are embedded. So you can like manipulate the droplet and then see. And also Julie Serio's group has just come out with beads. So you know how you normally look at sort of these, you know, uh, sort of micro beads. They've actually put in more macro beads. And so they can like look because they know the mechanics of the bead and it's embedded in a tissue. They can actually back out the forces that are operating in the tissue from the shape of that sort of squishable bead, which is cool. Thank you. Yeah. So, so there's a question in the chat uh, from Cell. Uh, the question is many thanks for the interesting talk. I recall from Daphne and our paper an experimental condition treated with fibroblast conditioned medium, which resulted in kinetic arrest with large shape parameter. Is that related to the zero temperature mechanism you mentioned? I don't know whether you can see the chat. <laughs> I, can't, I can't, and I heard most of that question, but um... Let's see if I can. I think I think I can get out of the, the show, and then I can sort of see the um, chat here if I do this. Um, so, and also, I didn't hear who asked the question, and that would be helpful for me. So, who who was that? Sal. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So um, yeah. This there's this. Exactly. There's this large shape parameter at which this tissue arrests. And normally a large shape parameter is associated with a fluid like phase in general, especially when it's um, disordered, which it was. So there was no pneumatic alignment of the cells. The cells were ordered every which way and they just were very elongated. And normally you would say that's a solid light or sorry, that's a fluid like phase and you expect a lot of cell rearrangements. But it, precisely in that condition is a condition where the cells basically were completely arrested in their cell divisions. And we think that the dominant tension fluctuations in the system are driven by cell divisions. There's a really nice paper out of Javi Trepot's group that shows that actually there's a characteristic cycle of cortical fluctuations throughout the cell cycle. So what that means is in a stereotyped way, cells are actually actively actively contract, you know, contracting their edges in a confluent monolayer as a function of cell cycle, right? And so you can note those active fluctuations should generate, we've shown in models, that should be sufficient to generate rearrangements if it's fluid-like. And that's, we think the dominant fluctuations in these MDCK monolayer cells that allows them to remodel. And so in those cell types where we've basically messed with their cell division so much so that by the end of the experiment, they're not dividing at all. We think that precisely they're arrested in what would be a fluid like phase, but there's no cell divisions to generate any fluctuations to generate any remodeling. Does that answer your question? I hope so. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> oh, great. So, so um, uh, one quick question for me. So, you, you in your model, um, in, I guess in the first part, you mentioned you having this uh, active propulsion to generate this stress, but now you seem to be saying that it's mainly due to cell division that is generating the, 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 the stress. I think it's highly cell type dependent. Mm. So there's some cell types like uh, like um, Terry, uh, you know, Tibalt was saying actually that like there are some cell types where the focal adhesions and sort of gen there's like a lot of stress fibers and so generating strong like they're highly motile by themselves and that doesn't go away when they're in a monolayer and so there's some cell types where we think they're like crawling along the substrate and generating sort of self-propelled forces 
Um, but in these MDCK cell types, it's pretty clear that that's not what's going on, especially when they're on soft collagen gels. They don't have big stress fibers. Their focal adhesion dynamics are not very exciting. And so we think that the dominant source of fluctuations in that system are due to cell cycle fluctuation and uh, tension fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is there any uh, way to partition out these two contributions? If uh, Yeah, that, that's a great, that's a really great question, one that we've been thinking about. So one thing that we've been thinking about is using traction force microscopy to basically back, because um, we, we assume that that would be dominated by sort of the interactions, you know, with the substrate and that, that maybe the fluctuations of uh, tension along cell-cell interfaces would contribute less so we think we might be able to sort of, you know, because like one experiment you'd like to do is we know that on glass slides or very stiff substrates, you really get those stress fibers set up and there might be a lot more, um, you know, sort of activity that is more like self propulsion. And so there are some ways of thinking about doing that. Another thing that you could think of to do is to um, look at fret sensors along those interfaces and sort of look at the fluctuations in the fret sensors. but it's not really clear that those are at the right scale because they're sort of the fret sensors are much smaller scale and they may not get the whole change of that interfacial tension, which is pretty wide. There's a pretty wide zone of cortical actomyosin generating that active force along that system. So um, yeah, it's a good question. So the short answer is no, I don't exactly, we have some ideas, but I don't know how to do that yet. All right, okay, thank you. Um, there's another, okay, a follow-up question by Sal. Would you like to ask it yourself, Sal? Uh, I think you're here. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so I was, ju I was just wondering then, do you know uh, kind of what um, factors in the fibroblast condition the medium sort of is responsible for the cell division arrest? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, so I, I'm assuming you're, at, are you asking about in the wild type system or in the um, uh, pharmacologically perturbed systems? Uh, I think in the wild type uh, situation when you treat the fibroblast condition yeah. medium. Yeah, so um, we don't know. I mean, there's been, that feature has been reported in a lot of experiments on MDCK monolayers. It's known that it's sort of, people call it like contact inhibition of cell division, right? So it's known that in these, N, like in generic MDCK monolayers, as they mature, they stop dividing, right? And there's a question of what's causing them to stop dividing. Do they have like cell area sensors, right? Because on different substrates, they sort of tend to sort of stop dividing at different, cell areas, you know, what I mean? so the short answer is, is I think it's a collective, I mean, I don't think it's something in the fibroblast medium that's responsible. I think the cells are actively sensing their environments and they're executing a program that stops their cell divisions once they reach some condition, which we don't know exactly what it is. Um, and I think they sort of, you know, it's clearly different in some ways on those different, um, substrates of different stiffnesses. So that provides some clues as to like, they must be doing some kind of sensing that depends on the, you know, whatever they're sensing to stop their cell divisions does depend apparently on the stiffness of the um, substrate. Thanks. All right, are there any more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Lisa again for the really fantastic talk and the inspiring story from, from her research. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. All so right. Thank you very much, Lisa. Fantastic talk. Thanks. It's so nice to be here. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much and bye-bye, yep. everyone.